All right. Welcome, everybody. Hello, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Simple Rules for Manufacturers to Survive and Thrive in a Crisis, brought to you by MFG with special guest and world-renowned small business expert, Greg Crabtree. I'd like to thank Dr. Ronald Hollis, President and CEO of MFG, for joining me today. I'm Adam Cleveland with MFG, and I'll be your host and moderator. In this webinar, you will learn the core principles on how to guide your business out of any crisis, including why managing cash is more important than profit, how to reduce costs and manage cash effectively in a crisis, which metrics matter to accurately evaluate the health of your business, and how to create and implement a 90-day plan that will help save your business. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. You'll see on your screen uh, a couple of boxes on the bottom, on the bottom uh, section of your screen. Um, this is a, the primary location for the q and I want to point that out first. All the Q&A will be handled in the last 15 minutes of the webinar. But this is meant to be interactive and to take your questions, so please use that. And then just backing up to the top, the webinar will be available at mfg.com and the slides and recording will be emailed to you directly. Now I'll turn it over to Ron to introduce MFG and our special guest. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate that. Excellent. Um, I'm Ron Hollis, President and CEO of mfg.com and very excited to be here. Uh, you know, this is a unique webinar where we, we got together with Greg here so that we can provide real value to you as leaders of small businesses during this challenging time. Typically, MFG exists to help small manufacturers in the U.S. to grow their business. And our traditional way is using the power of a marketplace to make it easy for you to find new customers, buyers who need parts made. And we make it easy for buyers to find qualified manufacturers. And that's our normal world. And what we want to do is use that power to help manufacturers in the U.S. grow their business. Well, you know, we're in this unique situation where, you know, marketing is marketing, but we got more important things to do. And so we wanted to use the power of MFG and we did that to bring this together. And our why for today really is um, I've been in manufacturing my entire career and, you know, I love it. And I understand that this is a difficult time for a lot of people. You know, I'm, you know, I'm going through a couple of these crises and one of the fundamental pieces that you struggle with is not knowing and not having useful information to try to make non-emotional decisions. And that's why uh, I've asked Greg Crabtree, who I've worked with for over 20 years. He and I are friends, but we also work together in business, and I'm a, a huge respect because this, he's a guy who understands the fundamental numbers of business to eliminate the emotion. And uh, he's spoken all over the world, helped hundreds and hundreds of companies drive their business by just understanding what makes your business work from a numbers perspective. And that's what you need today, eliminate the emotions. He's a practical guy, author of Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits. So it's a no bullshit candy guy that's going to tell you some stuff. So I'm, I'm super excited today. I'm going to introduce Craig Crabtree. Yeah. Thanks, Ron. I uh, appreciate the ability to speak to uh, all of the MFG family. And uh, I, I think everybody's going to, to see that, uh, you know, these are unusual times, but yet there's opportunities. And so it's one of those things that we'll kind of go through this. And so the, you know, kind of the overarching, you know, uh, presentation is learning to stabilize your, your business and really how do you stabilize cash, navigate tough business decisions during these hard times. Uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and, uh, and jump right in. And so really break, we're going to break down your thinking into four groupings. So think of cash flow first. We'll go into that one, then revenues, then employees, and then expenses. So let's, let's jump into the concept of cash flow first. So, you know, one of the things that is the biggest challenge for entrepreneurs who run their business is to think in this term of cash basis, accrual basis, and when does cash show up and all that. And, and it's one of the things that I, I address this in the original book. I've got even more advanced features coming out in the next book release that'll be in here in about a couple of months. But more than ever, you've got to understand that managing cash flow is more important than profitability. Now, I get it that profitability is the initial action that starts the cash flow activity, but we're going to see unprecedented things that's going to affect that. So once you determine your expected profits and losses during this crisis, then you're going to calculate cash flow with two major expectations. 
Customers are going to take longer to pay you. Vendors are going to need you to pay faster. And you're probably not going to get advanced payments where you thought you were, or else you've got to make a really hard decision of does it make sense for you to still do business with somebody who can't give you the normal terms that you previously did. Hopefully you were somebody who followed our guidelines of two months of operating expenses in cash with zero drawn on a line of credit as being their defining measure of full capitalization as a business. If you weren't there, you're going to be a little more challenged, but it's not to say that you won't get through this. So the key is once you've determined that cash flow impact of AR and AP, then you're going to use cash flow modeling, which will, will point you to some tools that we've made available for people who don't have those tools already built or have access to people like ourselves that, that run those models for their clients. And, and so we've developed some simplified techniques uh, on our website of simplenumbers.me to be able to, to help people through this crisis. But you're going to need to do this cash flow modeling weekly. And, and so just accept the fact that it's going to help you build some muscles to do the things you probably should have been doing, but now you're going to need to do it now more than ever. All right, so let, let's go into uh, looking at revenue next. You know, this is an unusual time. So as I've been talking to my manufacturing clients, what's interesting is, is we think there's some new opportunities and we think there's opportunities that in some of you, you're going to see opportunities of people that were manufacturing in China come back on shore. You're going to see some people go from long run manufacturing to uh, short run manufacturing with, with soft tooling. You're going to see some people go from soft tooling uh, onshore to hard tooling onshore. So all of these things are possible in that process, but you've got to look at the market and, and really the thing I always like to, to have entrepreneurs do is say, figure out what the market needs. And if the market needs something, can I do it profitably? And if I can do it profitably, as I describe in the next book, you know, that'll be coming out, can you do it at a 50% or better return on invested capital? And so that becomes the concept, you know, that we really start to set profit targeting, you know, from that standpoint. If you're going to be in a situation to where you can't be at a profitable level of your business, then you're going to need to really look at everything that you can do to generate either new revenues, better margins of what you've got, and then evaluate how long can you hang on from your funding sources. But don't overlook the fact that there are also possible opportunities in this process. And how good is your forecasting technique? Typically, we're recommending people to do hard, detailed forecasting every week to relook at forecast specifically over the next three months. And then you're going to start keep continuing to roll that forecast and probably look at more trend forecasting beyond that. But each week, you've got to look at this um, and, and make sure that you know that you're there. So let's look at, at costs next. And so as we talked about how to reduce costs and manage in this crisis, I'm going to have you bifurcate your looking at cost in two ways. Look at labor first and then look at uh, operating expenses second. Labor is a unique cost. It's a variable output motor. It comes to work every day with an attitude. It has good days. It has bad days. You know, guess what? This is a crisis to where you get to really start to take a look at your team and say, who really are the keepers? And I actually may be able to find better people available in the marketplace than I had. So we've already seen a situation across all of our client base, all across North America, where people are, are starting to become available that you'd only hope to have, have access to six months ago. So some of you will be able to take advantage of this opportunity. But you've also got to look at, you know, how disruptive it is to turn off labor. So, you know, look at layoffs, look at uh, furloughs and those things very carefully because it's a whole lot harder. One of the reasons why we have these government loan programs that are so generous right now is to keep workers in place. Because if you dismiss workers and think you're going to find that same worker who's already trained is going to come back in and plug in to restart a business, that's a little bit harder than most people think in that process. Uh, so let, let's look at payroll in particular. So in terms of employees, as I said, identify who you're going to protect, you know, and, and you've got to make sure you keep those people in place. Obviously, unprecedented is the PPP loan. I hope everybody listening here has applied for their PPP loan or at least been in contact with your lender. Actually, applications you know, are supposed to start tomorrow. 
this is a moving target as we speak. The latest guidance that we've received is that at first we thought uh, 1099 contractors uh, would be counted in your wages uh, part of the calculation. We now understand from multiple lenders that they're saying that the 1099 contractors will have to apply on their own and you'll only use wages for the compensation component you know, of the loan calculation. So what we're telling our clients is have both sets of information available so when you get in front of your lender, you'll have the latest guidance because this is, this is a very fast moving program that they're giving SBA and lenders administrative latitude moment by moment to change the rules of the framework that Congress set out. So just understand that this is a moving target and you won't know probably the final number until you apply in that process. If you're able to get the assistance, then you're going to, as Dave Ramsey says, you know, get the money and spend it on paper before you spend it in reality to determine the forgiveness piece. And so that's going to be kind of one of the things that you'll plan through that process. If you don't have enough money from the PPP or you don't don't qualify for it or you can't get it or you didn't apply for it, then you've got to go into kind of the normal crisis mode that we lived through in the previous recessions is you got to retain only the employees that are essential to the business. Now, keep in mind, one of the things that's out there is the federal unemployment benefit is, is plussed up. So essentially, if you lay off anybody from COVID-19 issues, that, that person on unemployment is going to get probably the roughly equivalent of about a $23 an hour benefit for, you know, quite some weeks. I think it goes for almost four months. The other thing, though, is you're also able, uh, if you don't apply for the PPP, there also is a, a tax credit that is available up to $5,000 a person uh, that, that if, if the funds run out for the PPP and these other things, that's another program that, that IRS just released guidance on this week you know, in that process. You can't use both programs. So you can't, you know, you can't use, can't get the $5,000 credit if you apply for the PPP. And most, you're, you're going to almost always apply for the PPP. That's going to be far more compensation coverage and forgiveness in value than, than the, the tax credit. But the tax credit is another thing to keep in mind. But other things you're going to look at, doing shared reduction of wages, lowering hours, uh, use family members to fill positions. You know, those are the key things that you're going to look at in the employee side. So let's look at operating costs next. And so the thing is, is there's two things. You can cut costs and you can postpone costs. And so you're going to look at each one. And the, the best technique, I, I'm a kind of an anti-budgeter. You know, I, I've never liked the idea of budgeting because I feel like budgeting is always a license to spend. It's not a license to make money. And so what I really want to do is evaluate every dollar of spending that comes up and evaluate and say, one, am I getting value for it? Two, can I delay it? Three, can I turn it off? And, and based on your evaluation, you just got a hard look at every expense run and ask those questions. Be careful of, of certain types of costs, though, that if you turn them off, it's more expensive to turn it back on. So just be mindful of that. Obviously, you know, we've got deferred tax payments. If you owe taxes from 19, those are kicked forward until July 15th. We expect quarterly estimated payments if needed. Uh, those will probably get kicked forward, but that guidance has not been issued yet. Most people are contacting their landlords and looking at rent deferral. Why would a landlord give you a rent deferral? Well, if the landlord has contacted their mortgage uh, holder, those mortgage holders have given them pretty much carte blanche ability to um, delay payments for at least three months to up to 12 months. And so the, the landlord, now they don't have to pass along that deferral benefit to you, but the good ones are and the not so good ones aren't. So just, but if you never ask, you're never going to get in that process. Obviously look at cutting discretionary costs. Now I'm a big fan of marketing. And so all of my clients who, my marketing clients, they know that I'm a huge fan of good marketing. Now the thing is in your industry, you probably shouldn't totally cut off your marketing because now's the time for you to find those customers that other people aren't able to serve. And, and so there's still going to be some manufacturing activity. There's still going to be some things out there. So you, you want to at least have a strategy. You won't, probably won't go dark on advertising or marketing spend, but you know, at least 
you know, be mindful of what you can do to adjust that. But certainly travel costs are way down because we can't travel. Uh, incentive compensations, contributions, you've seen a lot of the big companies, you know, talking about, you know, uh, postponing bonus programs and you know, incentive pay and those things, you know, postponing, uh, you know, contributions to retirement plans. Obviously, you're probably going to really be hesitant to do any capital expenditures at the moment, but not to say that if you have resources, you may want to consider capital expenditures because you may get a better deal. Here's the thing, you know, I, I was around with Ron back during the 2008, 2009 recession. And um, guess what? 2009, 10, and 11 were three of the most profitable years our clients ever had when everybody else was moaning and complaining about a recession because they were fully capitalized. They looked at these opportunities and they took this as an opportunity to beat the market, not be a victim of the market. The other things is if you have segments of your business, so many of you, you may have a rapid prototyping segment, you may have a, a uh, high volume uh, manufacturing segment, you might have an engineering segment. This is, in, we call this in our simple numbers mindset, we call this the profit cube. So if you look at all the segments of your business, you gotta look at these and say, which ones are truly contributing a positive margin? And if they're not, I probably have to turn that one down or turn it off until I can possibly restart it and, and nurture it into a better profitability mode. And so now more than ever, you gotta look at that. Now, here's the other thing. Not only do I have to look at it from a margin standpoint, I gotta look at the different trade capital costs, the ARs and the inventories minus the APs and deferred revenues, that's what we call trade capital. I got to compare that trade capital to the margin of each one of those segments. And what we're finding, especially in the manufacturing space, we were talking with one of our Canadian manufacturers, you know, last week. And, and really, you know, they were talking about certain programs that they had customers making bad economic decisions, choosing short run tooling methods just because it was short run cheaper, but yet they knew that their product with good hard tooling, longer run methods actually was going to be a better return on investment. And so we offered with them, we have a technique to actually look at that on a case by case basis using the return on investment principles to actually help people make a good mathematical decision given all the facts and circumstances. So you're going to have to truly get in tune with that right now because you can't get sloppy with things that require a lot of holding of AR and paying expenses early. I got to have a balance of those things also in relation to the margin being created by that activity. And then obviously the last thing, if you got any shipments from suppliers that you can postpone or cancel because you don't need them, if they're still in the cancellation phase, obviously we've already seen China having some of the disruption in terms of as they restarted, they didn't quite have everybody's factory full because people had started canceling orders. So you can start to see that. So, uh, so let, let's go next. Um, and so here, as you deal with customers, you're gonna adapt. You know, you, you may, you're gonna have to give longer terms, be careful in the sense that you're extending credit. And, and so not to say that you wouldn't, but you're going to have to put that extra uh, thought into it to say, can that customer repay me if I give them terms? And then how quickly, you know, is that going to turn into cash from us? But at the end of the day, as we said, just expect, you know, customers to pay, uh, pay slower, you know, as the recovery starts. And then um, next slide is the uh, vendors and suppliers. You know, I mean, some vendors will have the ability to work with you on normal terms. This is where you can solidify the team of people that you work with all the way from vendor to customer. But, you know, but there's going to be some vendors that are going to be damaged and they, they won't be able to work without you paying them in advance. So just understand that if vendors, you know, really kind of pound their fists and they get a little bit more, you know, concerned about what's in it for them, then you may have to, to look at a different supplier and you may find better suppliers than what you found in the past. But in general, just expect shorter payment terms. So let's now look at uh, uh, the next slide is the funding sources. So obviously, uh, if you've got any fixed term debt in your business, if you bought equipment, uh, if you've got leases, go to those people and see if they will give you payment deferrals. You've got to save every dime of cash you can. In most of those cases, you're just throwing those note balances to the end uh, of the note. And so our real estate clients, they're taking the deferrals as long as it's throwing it to the back end of the note. 
we've we've had some of our real estate clients uh, have Freddie and Franny, uh, uh, Freddie and Fannie Mae loans that those uh, that they were offered was really just turns into a balloon note. So be careful of a deferral that turns into a balloon. You don't want that because you may not, you can't expect to have a, a big wad of cash to pay at some point in the future. Uh, obviously, evaluate your credit lines. We're not seeing banks pull credit lines uh, like they did back in 08 and 09. Uh, not to say that they won't at some point, but pretty much they've been pretty well backstopped by the Fed. Uh, to keep all of those things in place. Now, they're not too generous in giving out new lines of credit. They're really pushing everybody to the PPP loan support and the economic injury disaster loans. Obviously, all of you, as I said, you should be ready to hit go tomorrow with your lender for your uh, the PPP loan. Uh, once you get your, once you know the PPP loan proceeds, you're going to then look at do you need an economic injury disaster loan. There's been some confusion that says you can't have both. The reality is yes, you can. They just can't fund the same losses. So essentially, it's what we've prescribed for our clients is to do the PPP loan first, and then once you know how much the funding piece is, then you just count that in your cash flows in your application for the EIDL. Um, obviously, one other piece that people sometimes might forget about is also borrowing against a line of credit. Um, you know, so that's certainly something that uh, I'm sorry, borrowing against life insurance policies um, is is a funding source that may be available, but you know, understand there's also uh, risk against that as well. So next slide is we'll talk about how to make a plan. You know, you know, do you have a plan? I mean, you, you can't just wing this. This is where you got to sit down, do the hard math, go through the numbers and, and really quantify it. If you don't feel like you can do this, this is where you're gonna have to reach out and get some help. There's individual consultants. Obviously, we're, we do this for a living, so uh, we have a, a, a simple numbers process that we use to, to help all of our clients. Um, we've made available to you guys so we, we can actually help you go through the simplified model that we posted on the simplenumbers.me site if it's too daunting for you to, to fill out yourself. We also have our more robust model for larger businesses to actually do both segment analysis analysis and ongoing repeating cash flow uh, analysis. But it's imperative. You must quantify the cash flow need. You cannot wing it in times like this or you're going to fly too close to the sun and it's not going to turn out pretty in, in most of those circumstances. So from there, uh, next thing is um, really these, uh, these are the key metrics that are slightly different than normal. I mean, obviously you always gotta pay close attention to all these, but these are really, I kind of put these in order of where I would have your eyes focused on right now. Number one is, notice I don't say revenue. I say gross margin. Gross margin, the way Simple Numbers defines it, is revenue minus cost of goods sold before any labor is added. You must have a finite dollar amount of gross margin target that covers all of your current committed operating expenses and labor. That is, that is the most powerful number that we've seen clients manage through crisis moments because it is a clear, definable thing that you actually can measure week to week to week as the, week, as the weeks in the month build up. The next thing is you got to get into your days calculation. You got to keep a mindset of AR days, inventory days, AP days, and uh, potentially even deferred revenue days if you're able to have deferred revenue for some of your stuff. If you're running a loss, I mean, one of the things that when I first met Ron, Ron had this calculation called days until death. Now, I, I wasn't a fan of the days until death calculation, but it, it, it actually is a pretty practical way in times like this of looking at it when you're running at a loss and you got to, you got to fund those. And so the way I would modify that calculation that he used to do is I would say, if you're running at a loss, these are days of funding available at the current loss rate. And funding would be the sum of your current cash balances as well as any operating lines of credit or access to other funds outside the business. And then the last piece, as I mentioned earlier, you would look at margin production by customer location or line of business. It, now more than ever, you've really got to understand your segment margin creation to where you, you can't let a bad segment of the business pull down the good segments of the business, you know, in, in that process. So uh, next thing is, is, hey, you're not alone. I mean, there's people that can help you. 
my farm, uh, one of the nice things, I had my own farm for, for 33 years, and back in January, we merged with uh, Carr, Riggs, and Ingram. They are a, uh, a top 20 accounting firm in the U.S., uh, and so we've got a lot more resources than we ever had, but my consulting team stands ready. We can, we can help you create these cash flow models. We can help you go through best practices, um, you know, and, and really, you know, we're, we're actively in this process right now, helping people, you know, deal with their funding sources, you know, and work through the needs of, of their business and the process. And, and really, at the end of the day, the thing I would tell you, the last piece is, is critical before we go into the case studies, is you've got to evaluate your business's ability to overcome any loan that you take out. And in, in most of you should get through this without an impossible repayment structure. But if your business is in that mode of where you, you're looking at needing to borrow far more than you could ever repay, you just got to be really careful, you know, in that process and make sure that you don't overdo it and, and really damage um, your business's ability. You don't be spending the next 20 years of your profits trying to repay a loan, you know, in that process. So um, let, let's kind of go into a couple of the case studies here. But I think you guys will find this pretty interesting in a sense. I've got two case studies to quickly give you the analysis of these two case studies as well as then our prescription of what we found in these cases. So the first one is a manufacturing model, which is obviously is pretty, pretty uh, true to your hearts. Uh, this is based on a $4.6 million business that is um, – uh, running at about uh, $800,000 a year profit, so about 18% profit. So they were rolling along pretty good. And then this thing hit, and we forecasted, you'll see this case study on the, the, the our download page at simplenumbers.me. And, and we, uh, we showed them having operating losses of $500,000. But here's the part that everybody's got to get their head around. They actually are going to have cash flow losses of $800,000. And so if they had gone out and applied for just $500,000 of funding, they would have been short $300,000 of their funding needs. And so this is why you have to do the math. In their case, they're gonna, uh, when we first did this uh, scenario, they were calling this the keeping workers paid loan. So this is actually the PPP loan now. So they, will, they would be able to get $326,000 of, of the PPP loan, and then they would go out and they would uh, do an application for the EIDL, you know, to fund the other $475,000. And so that's their prescription of how they would get through this. And then, um, uh, then the next one, it, it, the next slide you look at is the manufacturing, I'm sorry, the, um, the cash flow, uh, go back one, Adam, if you would. So this is a graph that we put into the model that I really think, you know, accurately shows you the impact. So you can see that the orange lines represent cash flow changes in trade capital. The blue lines represent profitability or losses. And so what you're going to see here is you can see the big dip right there during the crisis, but you're going to see continued cash flow negativity through the end of the year. And then when they recover, they just don't have the huge pop when they recover. And so that's why it's going to take $800,000 for them to get through that process. So let's go to a services business. So some of you listening to this may be service bureaus. So this is going to be kind of a similar model for you. In a services business, this was actually based on a marketing firm, but the, you're, it's going to be probably similar for you guys is we showed them having drastically declining revenues. But if you're a services business, you got to be really careful in terms of cutting labor because you've worked really hard to build a team of people. And so therefore this model showed pretty much keeping all their people in place. And they went from about a $400,000 a year profit as a three and a half million dollar business to a $600,000 operating loss with $700,000 of cash flow losses. And so their prescription here would be a a PPP loan of 300000 supplemented by an economic disaster loan of 400000 So these are good examples for you guys to kind of follow. And as I said, there's a couple of other, there's a restaurant case study on, on the website. There's also a uh, sales business that's on the website as well. But you're going to be able to look at those and say, these are classic examples of understanding that in each of them, we, we forecasted day sales increasing, AP days decreasing, and you can see the cash flow impact, you know, from that process. Uh, and so, 
Uh, and then uh, let's see, with that, I, I think, uh, Ron, we're ready for Q&A if you've got any questions that have come in. Excellent. All right, so if anyone has questions, just go ahead and post them up there. It should be um, one of your fancy buttons on, the, on there. So, uh, you know, one of the first ones that came in, we have a couple, and I encourage you to ask them if you have it. It's great information, very applicable to business. Uh, you know, in reducing the cost, is it better to uh, reduce compensation or better to furlough or layoff? Yeah, so this is the interesting thing that's different because of the PPP loan. So what most businesses are doing, so keep in mind the basis of the PPP loan, can't, you can't use compensation greater than 100000 uh, and during the evaluation period for forgiveness, you can't use compensation greater than 100000 So the most you can pay a person a month is 8333 during those, those uh, two months of the evaluation. So here's where, as I said earlier, I kind of threw it out there, but Dave Ramsey, the great uh, you know, personal finance guy, talks about personal budgeting. He says, you know, you got to spend your paycheck on paper first and then execute. Well, that's what you're going to do. You're going to have, you're going to take that question that you ask and split it into two time periods. You're going to look at the eight week uh, forgiveness period and spend it a certain way that way and then post that eight week period. So as of June 30th, you're going to have to make another set of economic decisions. And those economic decisions get a little more complex at June 30th because if you apply today for the economic disaster loan, you might be lucky if you get funding by June 30th. I mean, so that's how long of a queue there is for the economic disaster loan. They're, they're working hard. They've streamlined the application process in the last week and fixed some of those problems, but pretty much we're expecting a 60 to 90 day funding thing. And so you may have to keep people at a relatively normal rate of pay through June and then in, in July, you're going to have to make another hard decision where you might have to take a different technique then. And that's why you kind of have to model it out. I mean, it, it, you just won't, it's not as, as simple as a, as a typical crisis. Okay. All right. So we have uh, Jeff we're here asking what dates for the look back do we use to compile the required information for the PPP loan? Yeah, so this is one that's been changing. Uh, so it started off being March 1st through February of March 1st of 19 through February 20. They finally realized that, hey, you know, it's a whole lot simpler if we just use calendar year 2019. So that is the, the now the calculation period for a full time business. Now, there's still a, a short period if you're a seasonal business, but all of you guys should be, you know, uh, ongoing businesses. So you're going to use calendar year 2019, which is makes it so much easier to pull the required payroll records. That's the main basis of documentation for this. Okay. Excellent. All right. And, um, oh, there's a, how does one calculate cash flow? <laughs> cash flow <laughs> is quite simply, uh, it, you start with, you have the accrual basis net income, and then you start uh, calculating the pluses, the increases and decreases of every balance sheet item other than cash. That, that actually is the simplistic form. If you actually went to your balance sheet and compared every line item on your balance sheet, from the beginning, uh, from the end of last year to, uh, let's, let's say, uh, if from December 31st of 18 to December 31st of 19, you just look at the change in those balance sheet items, that net income plus the change in everything other than cash is actually the net change in cash. And so what in, in simplistic terms, I would break it down this way. It is your net income on the accrual basis, plus or minus the changes in trade capital, which is AR inventory work in progress, minus AP inventory accrued expense, AP uh, accrued expenses and deferred revenue. Those are the, those turnover items. And then minus the changes in what we call infrastructure capital, which is fixed assets, uh, minus depreciation, minus the debt associated with those fixed assets. And then, then it's finally the change in cash. And, and so what I've tried to do, and you'll see this in the templates that I have on the website, is I've, I've created a simple numbers capital balance sheet. 
And really, we've broken the balance sheet into three components, trade capital, infrastructure capital, and buffer capital. Buffer capital is cash minus line of credit. And so it's a much more practical structure of how to use the balance sheet rather than the traditional accounting version of assets on the left and liabilities on the right, and everything's disconnected and nobody knows how to use it. All right, excellent. All right, now they're rolling. So we got now on the PPP, on the, what about the number of jobs or employees? Is it the average of 2019 or the number as of February 15th? Um, it is going to be the average of 20. Uh, well, let's see. I, I think on that one, uh, once again, you know, that one is, is one of those that they, they keep tweaking. And so for the, for the forgiveness piece, you actually have a couple of options. Uh, so there's the average number of FTEs per month between February 15th of 19 to June 30th of, of 2019. The average uh, FTEs from January 1st of 20 to February 29th of 20. And, and so you're going to have two different versions and you're just going to pick whichever one works best. And so that, that's really kind of where, you know, you're just going to have to be flexible in, in terms of looking at each of those options. But that was, that was actually from a document from the U S chamber of commerce that, that came out last week that I was reading that from. Okay. All right. And, so we got and be mindful one. and be mindful that could change <laughs> because the administrator has right. the power to change things on a moment by moment basis, as we've seen. Yeah. That's true. Man. All right. So we got time for a couple more. So here we got Dan. If a business takes a PPP loan, does it require the business to maintain full employment for the year, even if business volume and cash flow will not support the cost of payroll? No, it, it, it's only the only thing you're being held accountable to is keep the PPP loan, understand the purpose of the PPP. They're trying, they're, they're betting that we're going to find a way to beat back this virus and get back to work by July 1st. They want you to have the ability to keep your workers in place so that you're able to restart faster and be back in business by July 1st. And it, it is to everybody's benefit economically for us to keep everybody in place and not destroy the okay. teams that we built. So that's, that's the key. But yeah, it, you're only held accountable to that eight week forgiveness period that starts the eight weeks post the day you get funded. Yeah, right. June 30th or something, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it, okay. it's roughly Excellent. June 30th, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I got a uh, non-finance. So how do you educate your team on these challenges, especially with their own concerns? So, so uh, you know, I'll take that with you don't mind, Greg. I mean, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, people. yeah, you're a good. I mean, I, mean, I, uh, I mean, I think uh, to me, you know, I, mean, I see this as a time for leadership to really shine. To, and and it, you know, you have all different very uh, different levels of leadership in a company, but but your true leaders need to stand up. And one of the things I see in working with companies you know, is that you know, leadership requires communication. And one of the things you go through and, you know, going through a couple of these challenges, uh, you come out of it and you say, what could I have done better? And, and one that always I say I should have done more of is more communication. And reason is when a leader is not communicating, he allows the imagination of his team to take over. Because we're all concerned, right? You know, and, and you know, you're hunkered down and you're trying to solve a problem, you're trying to save a company, but you gotta realize everyone's thinking about how they save their families, their houses, et cetera. And so over communicate, over communicate gets to be the, the trick. The last piece, which is also great for crisis, is you actually will leave this knowing who your your eight players are. The, those are who are with you, those that you're willing to go to war with, because um those who run away or they or they're not for it with you now, they're not going to be with you when it's easy or it's easy for them to do it easy. So you want to use this opportunity to really assess that. So, yeah. Greg, you have well, thoughts it, on that? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I've been saying, you know, this is a great time. This is like the lake being at a drought level and exposes all the stumps in the channel. You know, and so, <laughs> hey, Warren Buffett, man. Who's swimming that's naked, right. brother? <laughs> that's right. Uh, but, you know, I, I still can't help but go back to what we lived through, you know, in 08, 09, and, and yeah. 2010. And, and, and there again, I, I think if you didn't go into this prepared, this is what's different now than 08 is we didn't have a PPP loan. We didn't have an economic no. injury disaster loan program back in 08. I mean, the government just fell all over themselves, you know, during that recession. And, and this is just unprecedented support Absolutely. that you have the ability to fix everything that's wrong in your business. If you didn't get it right now, it's going to be a lot harder than the ones who, who were doing it right. But now's the time to, to, to get going with it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, you, I mean, I, you know, not you know, the, I'm amazed at the uh, how fast the government's worked and how simple they're actually making this. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, they're really making it so that the masses can actually take advantage and, and sustain their business. So, well, excellent. Yeah. All right. Um, we, we got uh, time for like two more. Uh, let's see here. Um, so if, if you do the PPP loan at the end of eight weeks, you have to let everyone go. What are the conditions of repayment of that loan? So I guess after, well, the, look, after the eight well, weeks, then you resort there. Well, if you if you spent the money during those eight weeks on those people, then you, you've met your obligation. Yes. I mean, you know, so you're you're fine. If you do end up not meeting all of the repayment or all of the forgiveness features, anything left over turns into a two year note at a half a percent interest. The original thought was it'd be a ten year am note at about six percent interest, but that changed so uh, about a week ago uh, in terms of what we started seeing. So. Yeah. Okay. And there's a clarification on the, you know, our understanding, their understanding, the question the asker is the mm-hmm. PPP forgiveness, you must retain the FTE levels for the balance of 2020 or for forfeit the forgiveness versus you're saying, uh, you suggest we only be required to keep staffing levels through the eight week span. So um, is it eight weeks or, or is it the balance? I mean, everything we got so far is the eight week span, right? Yeah, every, everything that I'm seeing, and, and like I said, now there again, you know, this is this is guidance that we're we're seeing, uh, but th- there's n- there's no way that you know they can hold you to maintaining it the rest of the year because that funding no. wasn't, <laughs> you know. So I I just um, I think you know because June thirtieth and then and go from there July first, right? So yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, but I mean, I think the theory would be if you get the loan, I mean. I, I don't know many ideas, but your business is going to be recoverable, right? Yeah, I guess yeah we, we, we would, we would think so. Yeah, and, and from right. now, we've ran a, a couple of, of models to where we've had clients with two different outcomes. There's people who applied for the PPP mm-hmm. that they're probably still not going to, they're going to, they would rather have an unforgivable loan with cash because they see a longer tail of, of, of challenge that they're going to face. So they would rather have a two year, mm. half a percent interest loan than mm. spend it on something which now they have no, because remember when to spend it, you have no cash left and it's, yes, mm-hmm. it's forgivable, but you still have no cash to get through a loss. <laughs> and, and, and so this, this is just kind of different thinking for people to work through in terms of an equation, which is like I said, uh, that, that's why we believe you just got to put the, put the pen to the paper and do the math. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is not a time to be lazy and, you know, get the right people. And so, so we'll wrap up with that, Greg. So uh, give me a, a feedback on where they can go to get this information and access your resources. Yeah. So, uh, so as I said, we merged back in January. So we're still in the process of getting integrated into the CRI family. Uh, and so the first place is, I would say, our book website, simplenumbers.me. Uh, there's a link on the, on the front page, landing page, to go to our, our crisis planning resource download page. And on that, you'll see videos of how to use the templates, uh, the templates themselves, the case studies, a sample chapter of chapter five of my new book uh, that I've got a, 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 a draft of that chapter out there that'll teach you about this concept of matching capital to your business structure um, and, and several other resources you know, there. So that, that's one place you can go to. The other one is CRICPA.com, the uh, Car Riggs and Ingram's website. We have a COVID-19 resources page. Fabulous, fabulous resources. One of the nice things about being part of a large firm now is we've got task force on every aspect of COVID-19. So we got a task force on business stabilization, which I'm a part of, and I've done recorded presentations for that. We've got a task force looking at Main Street Lending, which is the PPP program. We got a task force looking at SBA loans, and, and they've got presentations out there. We got task force looking at employment. Uh, issues in terms of uh, unemployment uh, benefits as well as uh, payroll tax credits for extended leave for your workers. So all of those things are out there at the CRICPA.com website and click on the COVID-19 resources tab. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Adam. You want to wrap it up for us as our, as our moderator here? 
Yeah, thanks a lot, Ron. Thank you so much, Greg. And thank you to everybody that joined. Um, this was a very meaty presentation. Again, I will follow up with the slides that you've seen today, as well as a video recording. And uh, again, just an extra special thank you to Greg for joining us. Really appreciate it. I appreciate it.